Hello and welcome to the Cisco Support Community. Today we present a NetPro Live Ask the Expert event inside Cisco Live and Networkers Virtual. Today, the, today during the event, our expert will be answering questions on embedded management technologies. My name is Daniel Gerson, and I am the content manager for Cisco Live and Networkers Virtual here at Cisco. Our expert joining me today is Joe Clark, a distinguished engineer for network management at Cisco. Joe will be providing an update on design tips and scripting help for embedded management technologies. These include Embedded Event Manager, Embedded Syslog Manager, and Embedded Menu Manager. Welcome, Joe. Thanks, Dan. Now I'd like to briefly outline the format for today's Ask the Expert event. Joe will start with a short presentation on network management for the first 25 minutes of the program, and then we will dive into the live question submissions for the remainder of the event. During our live presentation, you may submit a question to be answered by Joe and a team of Cisco technical experts using the submit box. Simply type your question and submit it. To see the latest questions and answers during today's presentation, be sure to click the refresh button at the bottom of your screen. The team of technical experts is well versed in network management technologies, so please start posting your questions now to give us the best chance of answering them. We'll be, answering polling, uh, we'll be asking polling questions during this webcast, and we encourage you to participate by answering them. To be sure the polling tool works properly, please disable your pop-up locker. Now let's get started with today's event by asking a polling question. What embedded management features are you most interested in? Embedded event manager, embedded syslog manager, embedded menu manager, or other? Please take a moment to answer. We will review the, the results of that poll momentarily, so submit your responses now. Now I would like to hand the mic to Joe, who will provide an overview on network management technology. Thanks, Dan. Today our uh, agenda will be the following. We're going to start out with an introduction. What do I mean when I uh, talk about things like instrumentation or embedded management? And then we'll look at some of these embedded management features. We'll look at the embedded event manager, syslog manager, and menu manager. And then we'll get to the all important and very fun question section. First, what do I mean by instrumentation? Well, instrumentation is what gives us the ability as operators or as administrators to see what's happening in our various devices. It, instrumentation allows us to build that dashboard or those gauges or those knobs to see what's going on in our devices, to give us that information about our network, to help us build baselines, and to help us understand. It gives us that ability to touch, to change, to, make, uh, to build knowledge about our network. Instrumentation is the intelligence. And the levels of instrumentation the device provides us to, uh, gives us different levels of being able to understand, being able to manipulate, and being able to control our devices and our network. Embedded management or embedded instrumentation is taking this intelligence and pushing it further down into the device. So instead of having your, uh, solely external network management applications or network management servers that can only look from without, we're giving the ability to look from within for the device to manage itself. So with embedded management, the device is able to more quickly uh, determine what's going on and react to those events. So you may imagine uh, one event may be that a, a critical link on our device goes down. And maybe that link is the primary uplink, the one that connects this device to the rest of our network. Well, if that were to go down, your external management system would probably only be able to tell you, hey, I'm not able to reach this device. But with the, uh, the power of embedded management, the device now has some more options. It can certainly see that the link's gone down, and maybe there's some high availability path that the device could take. That is, maybe there's a redundant link that the device could bring up. And embedded management allows us to do that. We tell the device beforehand, if you ever see this particular event occur, I would like you to react to it. And part of that reaction is to fail over to a redundant path. The other advantage of embedded management is it reduces some of the overhead associated with uh, polling. So normally your external network management systems would be periodically polling or waiting for events to come out over the network related to what's going on on the device. But with embedded management, the device is watching itself. So 
So we don't have that additional network traffic, and we don't have that additional overhead associated with the external polling. Embedded management, though, is not going to replace or fully replace your external network management. So what we're going to do is see that embedded management becomes complementary. And by using embedded management with external management, we can help build a more powerful and robust, all-encompassing network management solution. We really want to help make Cisco IOS and your devices the most powerful tools in your network management tool chain. The first technology we're going to look at today is the Embedded Event Manager. And the Embedded Event Manager is one of these inbox or internal or embedded network management instrumentations that allows us to react to events that occur on devices. And events are nothing more than things like syslog messages being generated, CLI commands being run, modules being inserted or removed, or SNMP objects changing their value. The way these events are, are found, the way these uh, situations the way the Embedded Event Manager learns about these particular conditions are by things known as event detectors. There's one event detector for each type of an event, and these event detectors are nothing more than an iOS processes. And they wait for these events to occur, and when they do, they float the information about the event up to this Embedded Event Manager uh, bus or server, and it's that server's responsibility to take some further action on that. And the advantages of EEM are allows, as I said earlier, allows us to react to these events in near real time as they occur on the device without waiting for an external network management system to come in and react to those events. And sometimes that, embedded, that external network management server wouldn't be able to react to these events. Graphically, this is what it's going to look like. Down here at the bottom, you see a list of some of the event detectors. This isn't an exhaustive list, and as I said, each one of these is going to be an iOS process. If you were to do a show proc CPU, you would see an event detector related to each one of these particular event types. When the event occurs, the event detector reacts to that and sends that information up to the embedded event manager server. It's the EEM server's job then to see if there's anything interested in that particular event. And the things that are interested are these EEM programs or policies. Policy is nothing more than one of these EEM programs. And they come in uh, generally one of two flavors. You have your applets, your embedded event manager applets, and your tickle policies, your script policies. And each one of these has slightly different architecture, but the goal is the same. These policies will react to the event, and they will take various actions to either remediate the event or to give you more information about what's going on. Applet policies are, are a more a simpler policies. Applet policies are generally one event, though uh, in modern versions of EEM you can react to multiple events within a certain policy, but generally we see one event per an applet and then a list of actions to take. Newer versions of EEM do provide a way of doing more advanced or programmatic constructs within applets, but in the beginning, in the, in the basic format of an applet, you have your event and you have a linear list of actions to take when that event occurs. Compare that with a tickle policy. A tickle policy is a script that will actually live in the, on the device's local flash file system. And this script is based on the full tickle 8.3.4 programming language. So you'll, there's, there's a lot you'll be able to do. You'll be able to do things like loops and conditionals. And you'll be able, again, to react to the event and perform a set of actions. Very simply, the anatomy of an applet. This is what you would see if you were to do a show run on the device. The entire body of the applet is going to live in the device's running configuration. The applet first has an event detector line, or, I'm sorry, a name of the applet. In this case, we're doing sample applet. And then it has the event detector line. This is the event that this applet is interested in. In this case, we're looking for the device to generate a syslog message that contains the pattern sys5 restart. When the device generates that syslog message and the syslog event detector sees it, it will send that information to the EEM server. The EEM server will then fire off this particular policy, this applet, and the last thing the applet's going to do once it sees the event is going to run these actions. And the actions will be run in a linear or lexicographical dictionary order fashion based on their label. The traditional concept or traditional uh, construct is to use uh, a numbering scheme for your labels. Here we have 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. You could certainly use any string you wanted for the label, but just be aware that they will be executed in lexicographical order. So 1.0 
10.0 would actually come after 1.0 and 9.0. So be aware when you're designing that, that these actions are going to be executed in that linear sort order. Now compare the applets with tickle policies. If you had a tickle policy registered and you were to do a show run, instead of seeing the actual body of the tickle script, you would just see one line referencing that script or registering that script with the EEM server. The actual script body itself would live on one of the device's local flash file systems. So you could use, for example, the more command to view the contents of that script. As I alluded to earlier, newer versions of EEM excuse me, EEM 3.0 and higher, have the ability of doing more programmatic constructs in applets. So we don't just have a simple linear list of actions. We could do a few more complex things like loops and conditionals. But there's still some things, for example, file manipulation, that we need to use Tickle scripts for. So Tickle does give us a more full power, more robust interface into programming with the Embedded Event Manager. All versions of iOS that support EEM and Tickle come with what are called system policies. And system policies are actually Tickle scripts that are shipped with iOS. They come within the iOS bundle, and they can be viewed on uh, an in-memory file system on the device. These scripts aren't registered by default, but they are available for you to register if you want, or you can look at them. You can actually use the more command, look at these scripts, and they may serve as a nice starting point for getting you familiar with uh, tickle scripting with EEM. Compare that with policies that you may write or that Cisco may provide to you aftermarket or after you've installed iOS. These are called user policies. And because they may have untrusted code, they're run with some restrictions. These restrictions are called safe tickle, and they're also throttled to prevent compromising the device's integrity. For those of you who can't wait for the movie, I've included a list of event detectors, not uh, completely comprehensive, but this gives you an idea of some of the events on which you can react to with the embedded event manager. Along with that, here are some of the actions that you can take when these events occur. Some of the more interesting ones are the ability to send an email directly from the device, the ability to actually run CLI commands from within your policies. So again, back to that example of the high availability with the critical uplink that goes down. If that critical uplink goes down, you can run the CLI commands necessary to recover from that. You can also send a syslog message right from the device. And in newer versions of EEM, you can also manipulate SNMP objects and SNMP notifications. Here's another chart showing you some of the more interesting versions, or some of the more interesting features of the Embedded Event Manager when they were first introduced iOS version-wise and when, uh, what version of EEM that corresponds to. Here's more documentation links on getting started with EEM, on helping you to be able to write both applet and tickle policies. And then in EEM 2.4, we actually did add some important enhancements, both to the CLI as well as multiple event support and some new event detectors. So we put out a white paper describing some of those features and providing some examples. And if you need support on the Embedded Event Manager, maybe you'd like help writing your own uh, tickle policies or coming up with a unique solution for your environment, I urge you to go to the Cisco Support Community or, or NetPro Network Management Forum and submit your questions there. And I'm generally pretty good about answering the ones that, uh, that are submitted there. And again, after this, uh, after this Ask, Ask the Expert session is over, I will be answering questions on that forum for the next two weeks on Embedded Event Manager and Embedded Management in general. If you're looking for an IDE or integrated development environment for EEM, the IDE EM tool from Nita Software might be up your alley. It provides a way of building uh, these policies, both applet and tickle, as well as facilitating deploying them to devices. I'm also working on this new initiative we have at Cisco called Embedded Automation Systems, or EASY. The idea of EASY is to come up with unique solutions using the Embedded Event Manager to help solve customer problems, to help you reduce the total cost of ownership of your Cisco network, and all the while making EEM easy to use, easy to deploy, and easy to operate. We already have some of these uh, packages, we call them, these easy packages, up on Cisco.com at www.cisco.com slash go slash easy. 
But if you have your own idea, if you'd like, if, if you have a, a nice general thing you'd like to see done, and you think it would make a good, uh, easy use case or easy package, I urge you to send email to ask-easy at cisco.com, and we can work with you to build this solution out. Thanks, Joe. Very informative presentation so far. I want to take a short break to review the results of our first polling question. Let's take a look. Okay, it looks like Embedded Event Manager, the clear winner here. So moving on, let's, uh, let's go to another poll. Please take a moment to answer this polling question. Okay, we'll continue on with the presentation. All right, now we're going to look at the embedded syslog manager. The embedded syslog manager is another, excuse me, I'm having an issue pushing this information out. Okay, there we go. The embedded syslog manager is another one of these embedded management features. It is also, like EEM, based on Tickle, but unlike EEM, it allows us to intercept syslog messages as they're sent from the device. With EEM, you saw that we were able to react when the device sends a syslog message, but by the time EEM gets a hold of it, the syslog message has already been sent out. That is, it's already in your logging buffer, or your syslog hosts have already seen it. If you want a way to be able to catch the syslog message, manipulate it or modify it or even drop it, then you need to use the embedded syslog manager. The embedded syslog manager sits in line in the message delivery path and allows us to grab a message, make changes to it, and then send it out. Or it allows us just to drop, not send the message out at all, or we can change the format of the message. For example, you might find it useful every time a certain syslog message is generated to be able to send an email of that message to some other email address or some uh, mailing list instead of sending the uh, syslog message out on the wire. Unlike EEM though, ESM requires you to use Tickle. With EEM, we had the ability of creating policies uh, with this applet syntax that went into the configuration. But with ESM, all of our syslog filters must be written using Tickle, again using the Tickle 834 language. And I've included the URL there showing you how to get started with using e ESM. And there are some good examples there. Uh, for example, there's the ability to correlate message as well as, like I said, send email, uh, send syslog messages via email. When configuring the embedded syslog manager, it's actually very simple. Once you have your syslog filter de uh, defined or designed, you can either upload that filter to the device's local flash, or you can load ESM filters from a network server. So you could centralize all of your ESM filters on, for example, a TFTP or SCP server and load your filters from there. But be aware that when the device boots up, the network may not be converged yet, and you may find it better to actually put your ESM filters locally on each of the devices. And then you'll just say logging filter, the URL or the, the uh, location of your filter, then what optionally what position you may want if you have multiple filters in the list. And then if your filter requires any arguments, like command line arguments, you can specify the args keyword and list your arguments there. In this example, I have a filter uh, called drop.tcl. Drop.tcl, you may imagine, could drop a certain syslog message, and it requires two arguments. It requires the uh, uh, mnemonic of the message, and it requires the severity of the message. Then, once you have your uh, syslog filter defined, you have to say, what destinations do I actually want to be filtered? And you can filter any of the available destinations. You can filter your console, your logging buffer, you can, figure, uh, can filter your syslog host, or you can uh, filter your VTY monitor, your terminal monitor. So you would just say logging, destination, and then the keyword filtered and then that destination becomes filtered. If you do have multiple filters and multiple destinations, and you want some destinations to receive some syslog message, and some destinations to receive other syslog messages, you can assign a destination a unique stream ID, and then you can, or you can share stream IDs, and then you can write messages to particular streams. 
Finally, we're going to look at the Embedded Menu Manager. The Embedded Menu Manager is an XML-based programmatic way of defining very rich and robust menus in iOS, so creating a very powerful menu-driven UI to iOS. It's a fairly recent feature. It was added in 12.4.20t, and just like EEM and ESM, it does rely on Tickle and does expose Tickle and give the user the ability of doing some Tickle manipulation within the menus. Looking at a very basic example of this, I've defined a very simple menu that says, Hello, Cisco Support Community. So, hello, thanks for joining. And then uh, it has three options. The first is just a simple print of a string. If I select option one, it will print out, Hi, essentially like a hello world. Or I can actually run iOS commands in the background. So option two, print iOS version, allows the device to run in the background using Tickle actually, the show version command, and then return that output to the user. And then finally I can exit. But you may be thinking, well, iOS has had a menu system for quite some time. Why EMM? Well, EMM gives you more power than what the basic iOS menu command gives you. With EMM, like I said, I have the ability to make use of the full Tickle 8.3.4 language. So based on one of the options in my menu, I can run a bunch of Tickle code in the background, maybe run some advanced commands, maybe do some uh, simplification of complex commands, or maybe I can grab a bunch of information from the device, process it, and then present a nice concise summary to the user. I also have the ability of doing context-sensitive help at each level of the menu. So I, ha I can have a help link up in the top, and when the user selects help, I can get help on the particular menu page on which I'm currently on. I can even do wizard-based uh, configuration. That is, I could step a user through a certain process, step-by-step, step, like you may be used to uh, in a graphical OS wizard-type interface. There's even built-in validation capability within the menu. That is, if I need the user to input some data, and I just don't want to take their word that the data is good, I can run it through validation and make sure that the data corresponds to what I expect before I make use of it. And finally, I have the ability of recording sessions in iOS, and I can play them back later, so I can build menus on the fly. Okay, thanks again, Joe. Before we get started with our live audience questions, the final polling results are in, so let's take a look at those. And it looks like a fairly good percentage of you are not very familiar with the embedded management technologies, so it looks like today's presentation will prove very helpful. Thank you to everyone who participated in the event polling. Now it's time to answer some of the questions our viewers have submitted today. By the way, if you can't stay with us for the discussion, please be sure to click on the evaluation buttons to let us know how this session met your business needs and ex expectations. The first 25 listeners to complete the evaluation will receive a $20 Amazon gift card. So please make sure to fill out those evaluations. Now we move on to the QA portion. Here's the first question for Joe. What effect does EEM have on routers or switch performance? Good question. Um, it really depends, actually. As we saw in the, in the slides, in the brief examples, we have those two different types of policies. We have the applets, we have the tickle scripts. And in general, and by default, EEM policies, both applet and tickle, require they uh, run within 20 seconds. Because after 20 seconds, they're going to be terminated. If they're still running, uh, they're going to be terminated by the scheduler. So really, you don't have a huge uh, potential for impact by default. We're looking at very simple, very straightforward uh, reactions to certain events. And these events are probably not occurring constantly. The EMM processes do run at a medium priority, though. So there is some potential for uh, uh, perhaps conflict with lower priority processes like SNMP. So really what you have to be careful of when you're defining your events and you're defining your policies, sorry, when you're defining your policies, is that you want to make sure they're not going to be doing anything excessive. You want these policies to help you more than you want them to hinder the performance of the device. So keep that in mind. Yes, you can increase the max run time beyond 20 seconds, but you don't want to run any tight loops. You want to make sure that everything 
uh, flows in more or less a linear fashion. You don't want to run into any potential uh, hang-ups, and you certainly don't want to run uh, certain polling uh, frequencies uh, too frequently. For example, with SNMP, with the SNMP event detector, which is a poll-based event detector, you can actually run that down into the seconds. I would strongly recommend that you not go below five-second polling. You don't want to continue to aggressively poll the device because a, the counters, whatever the objects you're looking at may not be updated that frequently. And B, again, you don't want to overwhelm the device. You don't want to put more load on it when you're actually trying to solve a problem that you may be having elsewhere. Excellent. Thanks, Joe. Let's move on to another question. How do I know what version of EEM my device supports? That's actually uh, can be a bit tricky. In EEM 2.4 and higher, there is a, a nice new command called show event manager version, which can tell you exactly uh, what version of the embedded event manager you have. However, before that, it's, it's a, little, a little bit of a heuristic. If you want to know if your device supports EEM version 2.1 or higher, you can do the uh, command show event manager environment. And if that command works, then you know your device supports at least EEM 2.1. With EEM 2.2, one of the big advantages or big additions with 2.2 was the addition of enhanced object tracking support, and that is the ability to react when a tracked object goes up, uh, goes down, or comes back up. And with that, you just want to see you can go into the Event Manager applet configuration. So you can do uh, Event Manager applet and then come up with some name, it can be like test, for example. And then you could do event track question mark. And if that command works, then you know that the device has 2.2, at least 2.2 support. There are some devices out there that, that do otherwise support EEM 2.2 or, or higher versions, but don't have tracking support. Uh, 6500s uh, before uh, 12.233 SXI and the uh, desktop switches, the 2Ks, the 3Ks, they may support a later version, or specifically the 3K, they may support later versions of EEM, but they don't have the track command. With 2.3, the big user-facing change was the ability to run interactive CLI commands from applet mode. So if you, again, you go into applet mode, event manager applet, and then test, for example, and you were to do action 1.0 space CLI space question mark, and you see one of the uh, available keywords there is pattern, then you know your device supports at least EEM 2.3. And again, now that we have 2.4, 3.0, 3.1, and 3.2, they all support the show event manager version command to very easily see what version of EEM you have. Thanks, Joe. Let's move on to another question. Which version of EEM added conditional logic support to EEM applets? The programmatic support and the additional logic was added in EEM 3.0 and higher. So with uh, 3.0, and the, the logic is actually very straightforward. So we saw that we had the ability to run actions like CLI, actions like syslog. Well, the, these new programmatic constructs were added just like the regular actions. So if you were to go into a device which supports EEM 3.0 and higher, and you were to go into applet submode, event manager applet, and some name, and you were to say action, give the action a label, you would see then, if you hit question mark, you would see all of the previous actions, things like syslog, things like CLI, but you would also see new actions like if, like wait, like while, and these are the, uh, the new programmatic constructs that allow us to do conditionals, that allow us to do loops, that allow us to pause execution for some time using wait, allow us to do things like for each. We can even do string manipulation. For example, we can do string matches or trim trailing or leading white space. And we can do regular expression searches. There's even an action regex now, a regular expression search, where we could search through a string or, for example, the output of a show command for a certain regular expression pattern. Thank you, Joe. Here's another question. Can I send an email message using an applet policy? Absolutely. Uh, email messages have been around for, uh, in this presentation, I've really focused on uh, EEM 2.1 and higher since that's the most uh, pervasive or the most common version that customers are going to have today. And yes, in that version, you can certainly send email from an applet using the uh, action mail command. So that it, 
again, in applet submode, if you do action, give the action a label, hit question mark, you would see one of the actions is mail. And then from there, you can type in the uh, email address from which you want to send mail, the email address or addresses to which you want to send mail. You can even do a carbon copy to one or more addresses. Then you need to specify your SMTP server. That is the mail server that will be doing the relaying for your email. You give your email a subject, and you, can give your, you have to give your email a body, the actual contents of the email. In newer versions of EEM, in 2.4, we added the ability for doing SMTP-based authentication. So some mail servers actually require you to specify a username and a password when you're using them to relay email. So in EEM 2.4, we added that capability. And in EEM 3.0, we added the capability of specifying a source interface from which you will make the TCP connection to the SMTP server. And that's important because especially in, in MPLS or VRF networks where you uh, may need to specify an exact management interface in order to make that successful TCP connection to your SMTP server, you'll need to be able to either specify a source IP or a source interface. So that capability, uh, that capability again, was added in EEM 3.0. Excellent. Thanks, Joe. Here's another question. Besides Tickle, are there any other programming languages that I can use with EEM? Actually, yes, there are. Um, it's very new, and, and, and it's uh, really geared towards one type of device, the switches. There's this new language, iOS SH, or the iOS shell. And this is a bash-like syntax, or, uh, syntax, or born-again shell, if you're familiar with that from Linux or Unix. Uh, bash-like syntax that allows you, just like Tickle, to uh, install these uh, .sh scripts on the device, register with the event you're interested in, and then be able to uh, run some CLI commands. It's really right now geared towards just running config-based commands. And the iOS SH forms the foundation for the smart port macros that you may be familiar with on, on like the uh, 3K series switches. So there, the ability to actually redirect or, or take output of show commands and, and analyze that is not there yet, uh, but it's planned. So right now, if you need to simplify executing uh, CLI commands, maybe making some small config changes, and you're on one of these uh, 3K switches, then iOS SH might be a good solution for you rather than going with Tickle. Okay, next question. How does the call home feature relate to EEM? How does Call Home relate to EEM? Well, right now there's not much integration between Call Home and EEM uh, from a user-facing standpoint. Internally, the Smart Call Home subsystem is using EEM somewhat to get access to the events being generated. For example, the OIR, uh, um, Online Insertion Removal, the syslog messages, there's some uh, back-end communication between the subsystems there. But what we're actually pushing right now is trying to get uh, Smart Call Home and EEM to work more closely together so that we're able to do more customized tracking of events happening on the device and more customized command gathering. If you're familiar with Smart Call Home now, there's a, a preset number of alert groups that you can um, subscribe to, and those alert groups, they react to certain events, for example, a syslog message being generated, and they gather a certain set of information. And that information not, might not be applicable in all cases. There might be some more information you'd like to gather. For example, you might want to gather some specific routing, like show IP OSPF database output. And that's not there yet, but we are hoping to extend Smart Call Home so that it can take more advantage of some of the EEM features offered. Okay, next question. What books would you recommend to get more, fami more familiar with Tickle? Well, actually, we have a book uh, going through Cisco Press now. It should be released before the end of the year on doing Tickle programming in iOS, and it will cover uh, the, all of the features I've talked about today. But a book that right now that's out, not really Cisco-specific, but that I enjoy and I use uh, just to get me more familiar with Tickle and, and, and the constructs of the Tickle language is the Programming Tickle TK. It's in its fourth edition. Um, available at, at stores like Amazon right now. And it's a great reference guide for learning the Tickle programming language. And if you also go to www.tickle.tk, you can look up the documentation, even for the older releases. So you can go and you can find the 8.3 documentation and use that. 
and the URLs that I put into the uh, into the slides, those are also good starting points. The uh, uh, Cisco.com slash go slash easy is a great site because we have some well-tested and some documented packages there. And there's even www.cisco.com slash go slash Cisco beyond, one word, Cisco beyond. And that's a, our, a public facing repository where both Cisco employees and customers can upload their EEM or Tickle solutions and share them uh, globally with people who might be interested. So there are some good resources out there for getting started, and we are actually going to put out a book uh, quite soon dedicated to Tickle scripting on iOS. Okay, moving on, next question. How does EMM differ from the standard iOS menu features? Well, EMM is all XML driven. So you will build a menu definition file using XML, and you can even embed into that Tickle commands. So you can embed uh, tickle sh commands to do very advanced things or even very simple things right into that. You can also build into your menus uh, help, uh, context sensitive help. So if you're on a certain page of a menu and the user selects the help option, it can pull up help for that specific section of the menu. There's also command validation. So I can make sure that the input entered by the user meets the requirements that I expect so that I'm not reacting to any bad data. So in short, it's a lot more flexible and it's a lot more powerful because I have that robust tickle scripting capability behind it. Okay, next question. How can EEM applets be used with interactive iOS commands? Well, before EEM 2.3, it can't. Before EEM 2.3, you would have had to use tickle if you needed to use an interactive command. And what do I mean by interactive commands? Things like, um, uh, crypto key zero eyes, the zero eyes command, because it asks you, instead of giving you the prompt back right away, it asks you an additional question. Are you sure you want to do this? Same thing with something like clear counters, or even the copy command. For example, uh, copy run TFTP, it, it's going to ask you some questions. For the copy command, there's actually something called file prompt quiet. If you go into iOS config T mode and, do, and, and configure the directive file prompt quiet, file or copy commands won't tend to be interactive. However, things like clear counters, crypto key zero eyes, and so on, those will still be interactive. So before EEM 2.3, you needed to be using Tickle to react to those prompts. In EEM 2.3 and higher, there was this new keyword added called the pattern keyword. So if you were to go into applet mode, you go into applet and do an action label CLI command and then put in a command such as clear counters, then instead of just hitting enter there, instead of just going down to the next uh, action, you would have a pattern keyword. So after the command, you would put in the, the keyword pattern, and then after pattern, you would specify a regular expression. And the regular expression is what do you want to match on in the output that comes back after running, for example, the clear counters command. So you just want to match on anything on that line, anything on the question being asked after you type clear counters. So what, what pattern really does is it temporarily overrides what EMM, or I'm sorry, what EEM is expecting to see from the device prompt. So EEM has a very powerful uh, hard-coded regular expression for m matching the device prompt. And the pattern keyword temporarily overrides that so that you say, nope, after you run this command, the device prompt or the prompt that will allow you to continue will be whatever I put in, this pat in the value of my pattern keyword. So it can be like, are you sure, or it can be, a lot of times people just match at the end of the line, like they'll put in a, a Y or they'll put in a colon or something to say, I want to match what's on this line. You're not done yet, though. So you put in the command, you put in the pattern to match the question that comes back out, out of the command. Now the next thing you need to do is create another action that answers that question. So right below your, your pattern, you would create another action another CLI action, and the command, so it would be CLI space command, and the command that you would execute would simply be the answer to that question. So for example, with clear counters, you would do something like action 1.0, CLI command, uh, clear counters, pattern colon, let's say, and then action 1.1, CLI command Y, saying, yes, I want to clear the counters. So remember, the pattern is overriding what e EEM thinks the device prompt is, so the Y is like another command. It's like the command that you would run at this particular question prompt. And then once you do those two actions 
uh, back to back like that, then you will have successfully cleared counters or you, you will have successfully run an interactive command using applet syntax. Thank you, Joe. There's another question from our audience. Can an EEM policy send an SNMP trap? Can an EEM policy send an SNMP trap? Yes, it can. In fact, the ability to send uh, SNMP traps has been around for quite a while, and it's very easy to do. You would, uh, from the applet or from your, your tickle, you would do an action, uh, uh, action SNMP trap, action SNMP dash trap, and then you have the option of specifying values for three var binds or variable bindings. Two of the var binds are integer var binds. There's an int data one keyword and an int data two keyword. And those can be whatever integer values you want. Then there's also an str or string data var bind. And here you can put in a free form string up to 255 characters. So it's really not useful for getting show command output off the device, but it could be very useful in delivering some uh, notification up to a network management system. So yes, you can send a trap, but once, in order to make sure that trap goes off of the device, you also have to configure another command outside of the EEM scope. You would have to configure a global command, snmp-server, enable traps, event-manager. Event-manager, and that will say, yes, I want to enable the event manager traps, so when my uh, EEM applet or tickle or iOS SH, when it, any of those policies then generate a trap, that trap can leave the device. Okay, next question. Is there a central location to find good EEM scripting examples? Yes, there is. There are actually two now. Uh, I, I've mentioned them both. The, the one, uh, the easy repository or embedded automation systems I talked about in the slides, www.cisco.com slash go slash easy. But the one that's been around for a lot longer and has quite a few scripts, both uh, user or customer contributed as well as Cisco contributed, is the Cisco Beyond repository. And that URL again is www.cisco.com slash go slash Cisco Beyond. And all of those policies are, are free. You can go, you can browse them, download them. They, they come with some help, some information about where they were tested or what platform you need to run them. And they can be a great uh, resource for getting started, especially with Tickle programming and EEM. Excellent, thank you. Another question. Why do my EEM policies fail when I enable TACAX on my devices? Well. Right now, uh, if your device has, if, you're, if you've configured command authorization on your device, that is, you want to make sure that everyone who's running commands is authorized to do so, and they're authorized to run the commands they're trying to run, EEM doesn't, doesn't plug into that by default. So when EEM runs a command, it runs a command as a null user. So no username is specified. AAA servers don't tend to like that. They want to see a username there so they can look that username up in their database and verify that that user is authorized to run the command they're trying to run. So in order to make sure that all your EEM policies will have a user associated with the CLI commands that they may need to run, you have to configure the global command event manager session CLI username and then specify a username. And that username needs to be a user who is authorized to run all of the CLI commands in all of the various policies. Now in EEM 3.1, there is a way of overriding command authorization on a per policy basis. But EEM 3.1 is still very new, and generally what you're going to find is in order to make sure that these policies still run with uh, AAA enabled or TACX integration enabled, you want to configure your session CLI username. Now, a lot of people see this and they say, well, how do I specify a password for this user? You don't need a password. This is solely for authorization purposes, not authentication purposes. The fact that the EEM policy was even registered on the device means that it was authenticated. So you'll never need to use a password with your EEM policies. Either when you go into enable mode within an EEM policy, you won't need to specify an enable password there. You're just going into enable mode that says, I want to step up the privileges associated with this policy. And the same thing with command authorization. You're just saying, I want to associate this username with the policy for authorization and accounting purposes. I'm not, I don't have to specify that user's password because, again, authentication is already assumed. 
Excellent. Well, moving on, this is a, will be our last question today. Okay. Is it possible to register an EEM policy that it is that is compiled? Yes, it is. We do support what's called the Tickle Pro bytecode com uh, uh, compiler, which is uh, available from SourceForge. Um, it's by compiled, I do mean bytecode. I don't mean you actually can create machine language out of this, but you can create a bytecode language out of this uh, using the Tickle Pro compiler, and then you can register those bytecode compiled policies on the device. You have to make sure you're using, uh, I, I typically use a Tickle Pro 1.5. Newer versions uh, support a different bytecode syntax and they don't uh, work with iOS, but I've been using a 1.5 actually on FreeBSD and it works uh, very well. Excellent. Thank you, Joe, and thank you for everyone for your questions. For those of you looking for a more detailed answer or have additional questions for Joe, please log on to the Cisco Support Community website. That's at https supportforums.cisco.com where Joe will be continuing to, ask, uh, to answer your questions through the community site over the next two weeks. Before we conclude, I'd like to cover a few additional items. Uh, the first is our main event, Cisco Live. Each year, thousands of your colleagues make room in their schedules for Cisco Live. With an agenda packed with world-class education, training, and networking opportunities, it is the one event that can make the biggest difference in your career. Developers like you come to Cisco Live to gain the expertise they need to create applications that use Cisco technologies to streamline biz key business functions such as marketing, sales, communications, and collaboration. There's no better place to get the knowledge you need to power your career. Early bird registration starts today. Come discover how knowledge, how knowledge is power at Cisco Live 2010, June 27th to July 1st in Las Vegas. Register now at www.cisco-live.com. We hope you enjoyed this live Cisco support community, Ask the Expert event in Cisco Live and Networkers Virtual. I encourage you to explore the virtual environment, including the Cisco and partner booths in the world of solutions, the on-demand technical sessions in the session catalog, and the blog center. Also, if you have not explored the Cisco support community, please take a moment to see all the program has to offer. Before signing off, Please take a few minutes to complete your evaluation of today's session. This will help us address your business needs and interests in the future. This concludes today's NetPro Ask the Expert event. Thank you, Joe, for joining me today. I'd also like to thank all of the viewers who logged in and for asking questions. Have a great day.